Western nation on the world stage. And when they put on the glitz, it's the kitchens that keep the cogs turning. An army can't fight on an empty stomach, and a monarch can't rule without having some food. It's the engine oil for the engine that is the British royal family. We open the door on life in the royal kitchens and get the inside scoop from the royal chefs. Working for the Queen was amazing. Cooking for kings and queens and presidents. They revealed the do's. Finger sandwiches, cut into four, minus the crust. And don'ts. You try and serve strawberries to the Queen in January and it's off to the tower, you're really in trouble. Of serving Her Majesty, whose private dining habits are not as extravagant as you may think. She eats her dinner off a tray, looking at the television. She likes it. We discover the lengths our royals go to in the name of diplomacy. It's very phallic. They didn't have to put the whole thing in their mouth, which would have been pretty gross. And delve into the shocking history of royal health and safety. It's a wonder, really, that the whole place didn't go down with cholera and typhoid. And reveal how Harry's kitchen curiosity could have scarred him for life. If I'd not been like Hussein Bolt racing across the floor, he would have yanked that pan down. This boiling water would have gone all over him. These are the secrets of the royal kitchens. Buckingham Palace, the monarch's official HQ and hub of royal engagements. At its core is the kitchen, a well-oiled machine with the capacity to cater on a mind-boggling scale. Every year, the royal family cater for thousands and thousands of people, and just at Buckingham Palace alone, it's 50,000 people every year. They have this convening power. They bring people together. And a lot of the events at which they do that, food does play a key role. This dinner is always an opportunity for us to come together as friends. With so many mouths to feed, it's no surprise that the royal shopping bill is eye-watering. In 2018, the royal family spent £1.6 million on food. That food will be food for garden parties, will be food for guests who are visiting that the Queen is entertaining. It'll be for the tea that she gives to the Prime Minister at their weekly audience. It's a huge amount of money, and, you know, most people's weekly shop is, you know, £50, £100 down the supermarket. It is an extraordinarily little sum for the premier monarchy in the world. And for us to have spent so little money on food shows how completely efficient and streamlined Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle have become. It's the highlight of any state visit of a visiting head of state to the UK. It's kind of the centrepiece, really. It's a very lavish affair, and preparations will start months before. A glittering state banquet, an occasion fit for the head of state of one of our closest allies. The Queen, of course, as head of state, has a hugely important role in the state visit and the state banquet. Unlike in the United States, the British head of state is not limited to two terms of four years. And the banquet is this incredibly sort of personal um, aspect of the visit to her. I certainly know that the Queen has personal involvement in the menu. She consulted and collaborates with her chefs. One of those chefs was Darren McCready, who worked in the Royal Kitchens for 11 years. Working for the Queen was amazing, cooking for kings and queens and presidents. When the Queen was holding a state banquet, it was his job to create a menu for the VIP guests. The first thing they take into account is, are there any allergies? Do they not eat shellfish? Does the president not eat broccoli? It's to show the best of British, locally sourced, something that's quite fresh and quite light. They've only used seasonal fruits in the summer, only used asparagus for that time of the year. Nothing really was important. And if possible, something off the estate, maybe some salmon from Balmoral or some venison from Sandringham. That attention to detail is selling Grand Britain. So both the way it's prepared and what it is speaks volumes. The four courses for the state banquet, there's the starter, which is always fish, the main course, which is always meat, and dessert is a fruit course, and then coffee and petit fours. Darren and his team had their work cut out, making over 600 plates of food for 170 guests. You started at six in the morning, and it was usually 11 o'clock at night by the time you finished. But efforts did not go unnoticed. 
The reward for all those long hours were two miniatures of gin, so you could have a gin and tonic. And that was a thank you from the Queen. And when were you supposed to drink a gin and tonic? Not while you were cooking. <laughs> Before the food is dished up, the table must be laid. The places are measured meticulously, a measuring stick is used. There's 18 inches of space between the centre of one plate and the centre of another. You don't have much space, so you can understand why they try to consolidate each setting. You've got the forks on the left, the knives on the right. The exception to that knife on the right rule is the little bread knife. In restaurants, you're probably used to seeing it actually on the plate, but for state banquets, they've decided to set it above the bread plate like so. There's even a secret system to prevent the Queen's food being tampered with. After everything is plated up, a page chooses at random one of the plates to be served to Her Majesty, so that if anyone... ...guest food is served, there are strict rules about how it's eaten. You do not sit down until the Queen sits down. When she starts eating, then you start eating. And traditionally, you would have to finish eating by the time the Queen would finish eating. So in years gone past, you know, courtiers would be kind of desperately trying to eat their food quite quickly. Queen Victoria was a famous gobbler, so people would often not be finished by the time she was finished. So they had to gobble their food as well. In Western culture, a lot of our dining etiquette is put in place to minimise the awareness that we are eating. It's small mouthful straight back, hands in the lap when we're not eating. And so with the royal family, they follow these rules in order to focus on building the rapport with the visiting dignitary that's sitting next to them. And for the diners, there are unspoken rules about who you talk to and when. If the Queen is talking to the guest on her right, which will be the visiting head of state, then the other female guest will talk to the person on their right. And then when the Queen switches, then the ladies switch and talk to the person on their left. And certain topics of conversation are firmly off the table. Politics is a good thing to avoid. Money is another good thing to avoid. And sex is another good thing to avoid. But just because you can't talk about sex doesn't mean you can't flirt. And to wash all that splendid food down, there's an array of drinks to hand. But they also come with a set of rules. The glasses that is closest to you is glass that is used first. A champagne flute for the toasts, then the smaller of the wine glasses is for white wine, generally with the fish course, then a larger wine glass for the red wine for the main course, and then a small glass for port. And then you have your water glass and that's always detached from the other glasses because that glass stays on the table throughout the meal, whereas the other glasses will be cleared as the banquet progresses. Despite intimate knowledge of the rule book, things can still go Prince Philip uttered blast as his glass dropped to the floor at a state banquet in 2003. Luckily, heads of state politely carried on as if nothing had happened. Coming up, we reveal the shocking past of Buckingham Palace's kitchens. It's a wonder, really, that the whole place didn't go down with cholera and typhoid. An un is overseen by the Queen. The Queen has a royal menu book that's completed by the chef, and the chef does three days' menus, and that gives us enough time to get all the produce in and prepare it. And when the menu book goes up to the Queen, she puts a line through the dishes that she doesn't want. She has a HP pencil, and she tick one or add something that she would prefer. If she's out for dinner, she puts a line through the page, and if she's got guests coming, she'll put two or three, so we know that she's entertaining. The Queen has particular tastes that a chef ignores at his peril. She knows what she likes, I think too spicy, because she meets that many people. The last thing she wants, I can smell garlic in my breath, or last night's curry. The Queen doesn't eat garlic, and the Queen doesn't serve garlic, because the Queen is concerned that garlic clings to the being, and you can smell it on the breath. If food is offered out of season, heads will roll. You try and serve strawberries to the Queen in January and it's off to the tower, you're really in trouble. 9am and it's time for breakfast. Typical breakfast for the Queen would be in her own sitting room. She'd have some hot tea and then a bowl of cereals from a plastic Tupperware container. It might have been served on a silver tray in, you know, lovely porcelain but it was still kept in Tupperware containers, just like in anyone else's kitchen back at home. 
Prince Charles has a very particular breakfast routine as well. Whenever the Prince of Wales came to stay with the Queen, he always arrived with that hamper of his own produce. And in the kitchen, we'd have jars of bottled plums from the Highgrove Garden. The instructions were to put two plums and a little juice into the bowl and send it into him for breakfast. I'd send in two plums, and he would make one. So they'd come back out after breakfast, and I'd put the other plum back into the jar and save it. So one morning, I thought, OK, he only eats one for breakfast, so I just put one plum in the jar and sent it out into the dining room. And the footman came through and said, His Royal Highness said, can you have two, please? So, so I had to keep sending two in every morning. This wholesome breakfast is a far cry from Queen Victoria's morning spread. It was famously elaborate. It included things like lamb chops, fowl, tongue, eggs, bacon, potatoes. She just went for it, and it's no surprise that she... The current queen is more likely to enjoy rich pickings at lunchtime, especially at Balmoral. Balmoral affords recreation as well as relaxation. Hunting, shooting and fishing. There's trout in the streams nearby and salmon at the right time of the year. And when they get a good catch, the kitchens spring into action, cooking a lunchtime dish of grilled fillet of salmon with a watercress sauce, one of the Queen's favourites. And royal chef Des Sweeney was the man to do it. Um, the salmon would have been caught in the River Dee, behind Balmoral. Des worked as the Queen's chef for three years. This is a smallish salmon. It's about five pound in weight. It's a bit of a go-to safe dish, one that the family enjoy, one that she likes to present to guests. Queen's guests would fish for salmon. Staff were allowed to fish. If they caught one, they would offer it to the Queen, who would politely decline. So I've got a fillet off. These are pin bones. They're very, very small. And if you're doing a large amount of salmon for like a state banquet, it's a very tedious job. A few years ago, when the Queen Mother was alive, unfortunately she got a fish bone stuck in her throat. Traditionally, you uh, swallow bread, and bread will take it down. But this day, it didn't work, so they had to get her to the hospital quite quickly, apparently. It wasn't me. So here I'm just taking the skin off the back of the salmon, and then we're just portioning out. The Queen famously hates waste. From the, the tail ends, we'd make fish cakes. We'd go down to staff, or that would go to breakfast dish. The Queen eats very sensibly, really. Meals at a regular time. She doesn't have big meals, doesn't have late meals. And it's really good for your metabolism to live like that. So it's been filleted lightly oiled, and I'm just going to grill it very simply. We make a few portions, normally one spare, just in case the worst happens, we drop one, or the tray gets spilled, or something like that. The Queen is particular about sauces, so Des has to ensure it's totally lump-free. Generally, the sauce has to be sort of processed, so it's very fine. Quite often, it'll be strained. So for plating up, I'm going to use some Norfolk Samphire, just on the bottom, just gives it a little texture. So there you have a grilled fillet of balmoral salmon, watercress sauce, a light lunch for the Queen. So with the Queen's lunch sorted, it's time to feed the corgis. And it's anything but a dog's dinner. They had their own menu. One day lamb, one day chicken, one day beef. And we'd have to make sure that all of the meats we cut into very, very fine dyes, a brunoir, so that there were no bones in there, because we couldn't have the royal corgis choking. It's four o'clock, and we can reveal the Queen's favorite form of refreshment. The absolute sacrosanct part of the Queen's Day. She loves afternoon tea. Actually, I think it's very instructive that when Meghan, Duchess of Sussex, first met the Queen, it was at afternoon tea at Royal Connection. Catherine of Braganza, wife of King Charles II, brought tea to England from her native Portugal. She drank it daily, and fashionable upper-class ladies flocked to copy her habit. Nowadays, tea drinking often accompanied by some delicious tidbits, remains a traditional afternoon treat for the royals. Finger sandwiches, so like the cucumber, smoked salmon, cream cheese, into four, minus the crust. And then you turn them on the edge and you cut the edge off. So they look like little 50p pieces. And that was how they presented. Scones every day and some sort of small cake. The queen does have a sweet tooth, anything with chocolate in. She particularly likes a chocolate biscuit cake, which is made with McVitie's biscuits. And quite a sweet nod in time spent with his granny. Prince William, actually, for his second wedding cake, chose a chocolate biscuit cake. 
to be served alongside the official kind of fruit cake that he had when he got married to Kate, because he remembered this chocolate biscuit cake from having um, tea with his granny. Even when it comes to sweet treats, the corgis are not left out. She'll often take one of the scones and just crumble it onto the carpet so that a, a corgi, a royal corgi, can enjoy afternoon tea with her. Another royal who's reported to enjoy an afternoon titbit is Prince Charles, although he is said to have rather precise requests. There's a great story about how he likes his eggs at four minutes exactly. So the kitchen staff frequently has several pots of eggs boiling so that when he does come in after a day's hunt, there's one egg that's been boiled at precisely four minutes that he would like to eat. His head of communications has absolutely denied this story. Often, when we hear stories about lavish demands from the royals, sometimes staff are anticipating what the royal might want. He might not even know that there were, you know, four different pans of water on the boil with all these eggs being prepared just in case. 7 p.m., it's gin o'clock. When you were the head of state of 16 countries, you might feel the need for a stiff drink. A drink was gin and dubonnet. On a big function, there would always be gin and dubonnet on most of the trays, just in case, you know, put a hand up and say, can I get a drink, please? When she's off duty, there is reported one element of the Queen's private dining that may feel familiar to many of us. She eats her dinner off a tray, looking at the television. She likes it. It's homely, it's cosy, it's comfortable. And to polish off dinner... Most days, there'd be a fruit bowl go up. Graham is a big fan of fresh fruit, especially stuff that's grown locally. And eating fruit has a particular method. Now, this is how the Queen would eat. And cut off one end, then we cut off the other end, and then we turn the knife on its side and go into the skin, like so, and then prising it open, and then cut a little bit off and eat like so. But there are times when the royals need to pop out for a treat that really hits the spot. It's the best thing I've eaten for a very long time. Can I pause you on that? Absolutely. <laughs> Fast foods were also tempting for the royal princes. William and Harry, they loved pizzas, burgers. They loved me to cook them burgers. I remember coming into work one morning and Nanny had asked for roasted chicken and she wanted lots of green vegetables served with it too. Well, I think William or Harry must have looked at the menu and thought, hmm, we don't want that. When I came in in the evening, there was a note on my desk and it said, Darren, please give the boys pizza for dinner tonight. Signed, Jess. I looked at it and thought, why is this in the writing of a five-year-old? And then I realized who'd written it. They actually got the roasted chicken. I was scared of the nanny. The boys' love of food nearly got one of them into serious trouble. I was cooking spaghetti bolognese for them. I had a big pan of water on the stove. And Prince Harry came in and I, I just happened to turn and look and he put his hand up on the pan and said, what's in here? And if I'd not been like his same bolt racing across the floor, he would have yanked that pan down. This boiling water would have gone all over him. Oh, that was a scary day. The modern royal kitchen is hot on health and safety, but that wasn't always the case. Kate Williams has come to the National Archives to expose a shocking state of affairs. When Victoria turned 18, she became queen and moved from Kensington Palace to Buckingham Palace. But Buckingham Palace had been neglected for seven years, and almost immediately after the queen moved in, there started to be complaints about the unholy stink. An investigative scientist was put on the case. What I've got here is this amazing report that was made by Dr. Leon Playfair in 1845. He says that what he's been asked to do is look into the evil complained of and ascertaining the causes which vitiate the air in that building. As he says here, the smells in the palace are so powerful as to produce nausea and feelings of sickness. And I think there had been some perception that perhaps it was the fires or the gas lights that had caused this horrible atmosphere. No, he said, the main evil is the kitchen. He says, I'm reminding you that one of the largest sewers in the world runs unfortunately through the precincts of the palace. Actually, it ran under the kitchens and... If this wasn't bad enough, there were a lot of...
parliamentary practices in the kitchens, including piling up the rubbish in the dustbins, which were, he says, filled with garbage of a very bad description. And next to them were urinals for the use of the male servants without a flow of water. You can't flush them. And actually, he's really quite rude about the palace. He says, I could not have believed it credible that such an extraordinary instance of scientific ignorance existed in any building in the present day. He cannot believe it. So you've got a potent combination here of rubbish, of unsanitary practices and of disgusting sewage. They are all eating food in these incredibly unsanitary conditions. It's a wonder, really, that the whole place didn't go down with cholera and typhoid. Coming up, a right royal mix-up in the kitchen. I said, the gardener wants to speak to you. And he went back upstairs and I walked with him. And he said, oh, good morning, Royal Highness. And I thought, it's not the gardener. And Kate and William have faced with a rather... The Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh or the Prince of Wales. More than 100 of them are food and drink businesses. <laughs> Everything from companies who make big beans, their fishmongers, to champagne producers. Kellogg's has a royal warrant. Schweppes has a royal warrant. Cadbury's. Fortnum & Mason has been filling the royal shopping trolley since the 18th century. They say that Fortnum & Mason is the royal grocer. It was a sweet store that was a focus for the duchesses. It's not to be confused with freebies. The royal warrant recipients are not necessarily providing free swag to the royal family. They're just preferred suppliers. And brands need to have supplied a royal household for five years. Then they can upgrade their packaging. When a business is granted a royal warrant, that allows them the opportunity to display a royal coat of arms on their packaging. Obviously, that's a huge accolade. But like all of us, royal tastes can change. Sometimes royal warrants can be revoked just because the royals have decided that they've gone off something. So Carr's Water Biscuits, which used to supply cheese biscuits to the royal family, they reapplied for their warrant and it wasn't granted. Our moral is a company that has been supplying the monarchy for generations. A whiskey distillery first granted a warrant by Prince Albert in 1848. On a recent visit, Prince Charles got stuck in Checking the goods were still worthy of this honour. <laughs> With a nod of approval given, it's back to Balmoral, where the kitchens are gearing up for a visit. Chef Darren McGrady accompanied the royals on several trips, and it's safe to say they don't pack lightly. All the equipment would go from Buckingham Palace spoons, ladles, pots, pans, dishes, everything would go up to Balmoral Castle. It took lots and lots of planning. You had to make sure that all the food was ordered to go into Balmoral Castle, where we were going for you know, four, six, eight weeks. And although the kitchen staff and equipment are the same, the royals like to muck in. Prince Philip loves to cook three, four, five nights a week. They would actually go off and barbecue in the hills. That's when the royal family liked to sort of relax and let their hair down. Once the trappings and routine of royalty are quietly laid aside, the few precious unwinding weeks at Balmoral are a time, too, for a gathering of strength for the year ahead. The job of being royal is strenuous. Prince Philip was very interested in food, um, and he'd come down and help choose ingredients for the barbecue, and the Queen used to put the salad together. Food is still chopped up in the kitchen, so all they have to do is mix it up. For us, it was good. It was more like a night off. Still served on nights. China, it's still served on nice silver, but they serve it themselves. And then afterwards, the Queen would actually rinse and scrape the dishes. I mean, imagine that. However, some felt it wasn't fitting for the Queen to be getting her hands dirty. Once when Mrs. Thatcher was up at Balmoral, she noticed that the Queen was doing the washing up without gloves. So Mrs. Thatcher went and bought her some rubber gloves and sent them to her, <laughs> which was rather sweet. <laughs> the sort of present that she would love. It wasn't just gifts that arrived unexpectedly. I was in the kitchen, I was on my own in there. And this old man walked in. And he was wearing tatty old clothes and he'd got this cardigan on with the arms all worn out. And he said, where's the chef? And I said, I'll just get him for you, sir. And I went down and found the head chef. And I said, 
the gardener wants to speak to you. And he went back upstairs and I walked with him. And he said, oh, good morning, Royal Highness. And I thought, it's not the gardener, it's Prince Philip. <sighs> the kitchens also play a key part in royal travel. The royals all over the world. The royal yacht Britannia arrives at Monrovia in the African Republic of Liberia with Queen Elizabeth, who is winding up her tour of African nations. On board, the Queen hosted politicians and dignitaries. And for the chefs, logistics were at the top of the menu. The food had to be sent down to Portsmouth, where it could be loaded onto Britannia and put in the freezers. And by the time we flew out with all the fresh produce, we were there, we were planned, and we were ready to cook. But cooking on a ship has its own challenges. You're in a confined space, the kitchen's not very big, you don't know where anything is. There was a lot of people, a lot of dignitaries, a lot of VIPs, a lot of security. A lot of them would come through the galley. So you'd be cooking away, and next thing there's more people walking through. So, it's like, is he working in the kitchen or is he a VIP? I don't know what he is. For a royal chef, the show must go on, come hell or high water. We were sailing into a storm. I put chocolate souffle on the menu, and that was a big mistake. It gotten around to my course, I put the souffles into the oven, and I went outside, and the storms were getting worse. I came back inside, looked at the souffles, and they were rocking around in the bowl. I just went outside, threw up over the side of Britannia. Oh. Sometimes it was so bad, the Queen would helicopter off and fly ahead, and it was like, okay, it's going to be rough. And of course, Prince Philip loved it. Yay, let's go, let's go, because he used to be a sailor. On tour, digestive disasters for the royals are to be avoided at all costs. When a royal goes on tour, huge consideration is given to what they eat. Just, <laughs> just a little bit, just a little bit. Individual tastes taken into consideration. They might say, well, Prince William likes curries or, you know, the, the for instance, famously, doesn't eat shellfish. Not because she doesn't like it, but because obviously shellfish can give you an upset stomach and if you're doing an important diplomatic tour, you don't want to miss a day because you're sick. She takes her bottled Malvern water and that's all she drinks. Sometimes food and drink can prove to be a diplomatic challenge. Now a coconut shell is handed to the Queen for the ceremonial drinking of the cup. She often has to eat things that she he might not privately wish to eat. Here, the mixing and drinking of the kava is of the greatest importance. But she does it because she's very dutiful and she doesn't want to offend her hosts. To the Western palate, the taste is, well, unusual. When our younger royals have been faced with unfamiliar delicacies, they don't always maintain their composure, as Emily Andrews witnessed. When I was on tour, William and Kate in 2016 in Canada. We were at this lovely kind of presentation of seasonal Canadian produce. Sun was shining, Kate was looking gorgeous. I was like, oh, this is lovely. Phallic looking, kind of long tube and kind of a bulbous part at the end. <laughs> it's a delicacy and you eat it. And so Kate and William were kind of going around the stalls and we were all, all as pressed, kind of waiting for them to present it. This geoduck clam and what would they do? And bless them, they both tried it. They managed stifle any kind of giggles. There's a slight giggle from Kate. So the etiquette there would just be to pick up the food item, have a little nibble, make some polite remark, and then place it down. Try a bit, think of England, carry on. I think they had a chopped up bit. They didn't have to put the whole thing in their mouth, which would have been pretty gross. Coming up, when Meghan came under fire for promoting her favourite fruit. They are involved in the exploitation of workers abroad, and how dare she uh, put it by taking half a pig and half a chicken and stitching them together. There's no nice way of stitching this, really. It's all quite Frankenstein. Henry VIII's kitchens were the largest in Tudor England, making over 800 meals per day. Pretty freaky, huh? The cockatrice was roasted on an open fire and served up by the king to his waiting VIPs. If you're Henry VIII's chef, you're just giving him a big signifier of his power here. You're really showing off his brilliance because only he can afford the best people who can make this incredible, creative, time-consuming dish. Henry basically spends the equivalent of £5 million on a massive meat showing off. How can we think of the craziest thing to do? I know, let's stuff a pig with a chicken. You know, how fun is that? Would you like to try some? I'm kind of terrified. And also, I'm quite excited because it does smell good. Well, let's give it a go. Let's, let's see what it's like. Let's give it a go. Oh, my God. 
gosh. Thank you. So I used to be a vegetarian. It's a good thing I'm no longer. Otherwise, I might be quite traumatised. OK. Mm. That is beautiful. If I was at Hampton Court eating this rather marvellous meat, I think I'd be pretty impressed. Well, I think we should drink to the cock and trees. Cheers. Cheers. The humble chicken has taken centre stage for our modern royals too. Famously, Meghan and Harry got engaged as they were trying to cook a roast chicken. It's a standard, typical night for us. It's a cosy night. Was, what were we doing? Just roasting chicken roasting and having... Chicken. <laughs> trying to roast chicken. Trying to roast a chicken. I think Harry said trying to cook a roast chicken. I mean, we know that Meghan is a very accomplished cook. Very romantic. He got on me. Diana roast dinner, but that's great. That's, you know, shows that they're normal. It's something that we can all imagine doing. It's not something that we think, oh, well, that's because they were royal, they were doing that. And any meal they eat can make the news. But it's not always a welcome headline, as a friend of Meghan's discovered on a visit to Kensington Palace. He posted what I'm sure he felt was a very innocuous photo of avocado toast and wrote that Megan was the avocado whisperer because she does such great avocado toast. One newspaper absolutely went after Megan for eating avocados, saying that they are involved in the exploitation of workers abroad and how it's a controversial thing to eat and how dare she uh, promote the consumption of avocados. An unconventional life in the limelight hasn't stopped the brothers from having an ordinary approach to food. We're living together as brothers and it's fantastic, it really is. He does most of the cooking, I just laze around watching TV. If you think about William when he was at university, he did have that regular university experience. You know, he lived with other students and that he did the things that other students do and that would have extended to the way that he ate as well. He certainly wasn't up in St Andrews with a chef who was preparing his meals, you know, that just wasn't happening. And same way with Harry when he was in the military. He didn't go with his own chef. It was very much a case that he fitted in and did what everyone else did. So they do have that pretty ordinary relationship with food. They're bringing it up to modern day, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> it's the new kids on the block. Harry and William don't want to like grandma. When William and Kate had apartment 1A at Kensington Palace renovated, they famously had two kitchens put in, one kitchen for them to use personally and also a professional kitchen for hosting events at Kensington Palace. Kate in the papers was dubbed two kitchens. When faced with a baking challenge, Kate can definitely rise to the occasion. William, however, could do with a little practice. Of course, when we think about the royals, and particularly the Queen, you know, they have loads of staff to do everything for them. But actually, Kate cooks a lot of them. In the United States, the British head of state is not limited to two terms of four years. And the banquet is this incredibly sort of personal um, aspect of the visit to her. I certainly know that the Queen has personal involvement in the menu. She consulted and collaborates with her chefs. One of those chefs was Darren McCready, who worked in the Royal Kitchens for 11 years. Working for the Queen was amazing, cooking for kings and queens and presidents. When the Queen was holding a state banquet, it was his job to create a menu for the VIP guests. The first thing they take into account is, are there any allergies? Do they not eat shellfish? Does the president not eat broccoli? It's to show the best of British, locally sourced, something that's quite fresh and quite light. They only use seasonal fruits in the summer, only use asparagus right time of the year. Nothing really was important. And if possible,